Hello, I am Joanne Borkman, a member of the University of California Davis Emeriti Association. In an effort to preserve the history of UC Davis and our retired colleagues, the Emeriti Association sponsors and manages the Video Records Project, telling the story of UC Davis through video recordings of oral histories. Since 1993, the Video Records Project has been preserving the first-hand accounts of the individuals and groups who were involved in making UC Davis one of the nation's, in fact, the world's leading universities. We now have about 500 of these interviews. Alan Jackman is the current chair of the Video Records Project. This interview is with Leo Chalupa, Distinguished Professor Emeritus and Chair Emeritus of Neurobiology, Physiology, and Behavior. He was appointed in 1975 and retired in 2009 to accept a position as Vice President of Research at George Washington University. His research focuses on the neurobiology of the developing visual system and the complementary roles of genetics and environment in shaping that development. He was the founding director of the UC Davis Center for Neuroscience, served as chair of neurobiology, physiology, and behavior from 1998 to 2009, and then as vice president research George Washington University starting in 2009. Leo was a fellow of the American Institute for the Advancement of Science. He is interviewed by his friend and colleague, Kimberly McAllister, professor of neurobiology, physiology, and behavior, and director of the Center for Neuroscience. Hi, Leo. It's really a pleasure to Hi, get Jen. a chance to interview you. <laughs> Thank you for so, doing this, because I know how busy you are. Oh, no, of course. <laughs> Likewise. So, so, Leo, you have really had a transformative impact on UC Davis and on so many people at UC Davis over the years, including myself. And so I'm really excited to, for, for you to get to tell your story about how you impacted UC Davis and, and what your trajectory was. So I think maybe we could start at the very beginning with, with um, tell us a little bit about your history and how you got interested in science and in research and, and in particular in neuroscience. So I'll start at the very, very beginning. Uh, my, my parents were refugees uh, from Ukraine, ironically. And so they escaped the Russians uh, when the war was ending. And uh, they and many thousands of other people were just going off to the West as far as they could. Uh, they ended up when the war just about ended in Germany in this displaced persons camp, you know, deja vu all over again. Here it is all these years later. And so I was born uh, in Germany, and and then my parents were in this displaced persons camp for five years. You have to have you have to then had a um, sponsor uh, in order to come somewhere, and and people wanted to go anywhere in the West. Uh, my grandmother had some long lost cousin in Manhattan, and so we had a sponsor, and we came in uh, 1949. I was uh, uh, four years old. We came into Manhattan. I still remember the boat. It was a it was a military transport. Took us to Boston, and the train took us into um, I guess it must have been Grand Central. And uh, a little later, we ended up at a little tenement on on what's now called Alphabet City in Manhattan, on Avenue on Seventh Street between Avenue um, C and D, about five hundred and forty square feet with my grandmother, my grandfather, uh, my brother, little baby brother and I, and my mother and father. And so that was the beginning. Uh, so I didn't speak English till I was probably six years old, you know? Uh, and I uh, remember the teacher uh, saying, shouting, uh, quiet, quiet, quiet. And I went to my dad who had just started working in a factory. My dad was a, was a teacher. And I said, I don't know, teacher screaming something about a wire about a wire I don't know why she's <laughs> and my dad said a wire and so we, we we couldn't figure it out what it was and it wasn't only later that I learned oh she wasn't saying wire she was saying quiet so that's the kind of you know environment and it was a your environment where there were a lot of other uh, kids uh, families that, that that came from uh, Ukraine as refugees and we, and so so the Lower East Side was like a U Ukrainian village I went to a Ukrainian Catholic parochial school uh, you know probably didn't really start speaking English till I was maybe six or seven. And uh, the big, 
the big thing for me was to get into Stuyvesant High School in, 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 in uh, Manhattan, which was an elite school. You took a test. Uh, for this morning, about prize winners than any school in the United States. Richard Axel was in my chemistry class. You know, oh, Richard wow. Axel. Uh, yeah, so so I used to help him with chemistry, believe it or not. And so the, so there are extraordinarily, extraordinarily smart kids. I mean, really, really smart kids there. And, you know, uh, for the first time, I kind of opened my eyes like, wow, these guys know so much more than I and all kinds of stuff. And I mean, extremely talented kids, you know. Kid that kid that uh, played at uh, at the Chopin uh, uh, Festival and Carnegie Hall, you know, stuff like that. It was just a mind blower. And uh, then uh, uh, you know, came time to think about college. I did well. I wasn't fantastic, but I did well in high school. And the counselor told me I should go to Cornell. I could get into Cornell. I told my dad, you know, what the, what the counselor said, and my dad said, "Where is it?" And I said, "I don't know." So we looked it up, Ithaca. My dad said, are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? Somebody's telling you to go to some little town upstate New York when people come from all over the world, you know, to go to New York. You're, you're, that counselor should be fired. And then, of course, when he found out that I would actually have to pay money to go to Cornell, that was the end of that story. So I went um, to a commuter college, Queens College, you know, uh, lived at home, uh, took a bus and a train to go there. Um, average student until I started taking some biology and psychology and was, you know, kind of turned on about the whole idea of mind. And uh, so I thought I wanted to be a psychotherapist. That seemed like a great thing to do, you know. Uh, I didn't much know about it, but I was reading about Freud and stuff like that. But what the big thing that happened to me was I took a required psychology class that had like 400 students from a brand new assistant professor, Dr. Robert Frank Weiss, who came from Yale, probably his mm -hmm. first year teacher. He was not a very good teacher. And the, and the New York kids were very tough. I mean, they, they basically, you know, chaos in the classroom. But this guy was so into what he was doing that it just fascinated me. So I moved from the back of the room to the front of the room just to listen to him. And he was totally unaware of what was happening in the classroom. I mean, it could have been fistfights. You know, he just kept talking about these elegant theories. And, people, and I'm just sat there like, this guy is either crazy or something. Anyway, so it comes uh, only final. Take the final, and I'm living at home. And a uh, phone call comes, and my mother says, there's a professor calling you. So I get on the phone, and it says, is this Leo Chalupa? Yeah. This is Professor Robert Frank Weiss. I thought, this can't be good. <laughs> and he said, you had about the final graded, and I want you to know that out of 412 students, you got the highest grade. Ooh. And my heart sank because I thought he was going to accuse me of cheating. You know? Oh. And, and so I said, yes. And he said, uh, would you be interested in working in my uh, research program? And, and I had no idea what, what program he was talking about. You know, so I said, yes. And he said, come to my office tomorrow at the it turned out that he had, he was a social psychologist. He had an NSF grant, and he was working on a models of conditioning of, of of attitudes, and he was paying me. So here I was, probably a junior, getting you know money to do this stuff, and I found out pretty quickly uh, that I liked it, and I found out pretty quickly I was good at it. So I would mm -hmm. start suggesting experiments and stuff like that, you know. And I got, so I have three papers, which are not on my CV, that are in social psychology. And so, you know, so I, I really liked it, the whole, you know, discovering it. You know, I mean, the whole thing just kind of turned me on. But I knew I didn't want to be a social psychologist, you know. I, I mean, I, I, that just was a little bit too soft for me. And, and, and so that was my turn on to research, was, was as a, getting picked out of the blue by this professor and, and you know, realizing hey, I have ideas that somebody can take seriously and I can think about this stuff in a kind of novel way as a, as a kid, you know. And if, immediately my grades went up from Bs and Cs to, to virtually all As. And, and, and so it kind of was a life changer. That's awesome. That's really amazing. And so from there, what, what happened next and how did you get into the um, biology side of, of neuroscience? Yeah, okay. So, so, so I... I um, Got married when I was 21 years old to Tanya. 
Uh, and and so right out of right out of grad school, we got married. And in fact, the summer we graduated, uh, she actually uh, younger, so she started working and going to school at night to finish college. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I applied and got into the Sydney University of New York in a program called neuropsychology. Many courses were held in the neurology department at Mount Sinai because Mount Sinai was then part of City University of New York, and it was great. I mean, I mean, you know, you really saw patients, you saw top neurologists in the country at that time, Morris Bender. I mean, this is before fMRI and stuff, you know, analyzing these patients. It was, it was just incredible. And, and, um, uh, and so I kind of, you know, really got turned on then. I had a, a, a pre-doctoral NIH fellowship. I also had a chance, a chance to teach undergraduates. So we were doing quite well. And, um, my uh, my thesis advisor was the chairman of the department. I was given a project uh, that I learned pretty quickly, well, unlike you, was completely worthless. Ah. It was a it was a project. You know, he had a grant, but he didn't know what was going on anymore. It was a project that would have been a good project maybe fifteen years later, uh, fifteen years earlier. But of course, I didn't know anything. You know, so I so I was working on this diligent. Look, it took me a long time to make the thing work. I finally made it, make it work and I was all excited about it. But then when I started reading the literature carefully, I realized this stuff was like hot 15 years ago, oh. you know? And then, and then I was like, okay, what do I do? And I decided, okay, what I'll do is I'll just, you know, continue just get my degree. You know, I mean, I mean, as opposed to, it was, I could have, I could have actually gone and worked with somebody at Rockefeller University, a guy called Neil Miller, which is very, very famous. It's a whole different story, but I decided, you know, I'm going to pursue this, I finish. And then when I finished, um, a friend of mine offered me a job at a small school on Long Island, you know, assistant mm -hmm. professor with Kenya track. This thing great, you know, great Gatsby, you know, and all that stuff. We could have bought a house and, and all that kind of stuff. So I told my mentor, who I hardly ever had any conversation about at all, you know. Uh, and I said, look, um, there's, a, there's a, I think they're going to offer me a job to, to be. And he said, well, you don't want to do that. I said, I don't. He said, no. I said, oh, what do I want to do? He said, you want to get a post up <laughs> with somebody who's really, you know, high power, internationally connected, running a big research lab. And I said, but, but this is like a job now. And he goes, you know, he says, 20 years from now, when you're in your 40s and you're teaching the same thing over and over again, you're always going to think, could I have made it in research? And I said, oh, well, you think I can? And he says, yeah, I think you can. But, you know, if you don't make it, Better to have tried and failed than never to try. Oh. So I said, well, 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 who should I go to? He says, you know, there's a guy, Don Lindsley at UCLA. You know, Don's a great guy. You know, one of the, he said, what he said, why don't you write to him? I said, California? He said, yeah. <laughs> I, had never been west, I had never been west of Philadelphia, my wife and I. So I wrote to him, and I was working on a, a part of my theory in the structure called the Polvenon. And it turned out, just as luck would have it, that he had a postdoc working on that, okay, as part of his grant. And so I got a phone call out of the blue from him that basically said, um, okay, when can you start? Just like that, you know, no references, nothing. And I said, uh, well, I'm gonna be finishing in about six months. He says, yeah, when you finish, just come out. That was it. <laughs> there, there was nothing in writing, you know, I, I had no idea what the what the pay was or whatever. So I finished the, my, my thesis. We, we gave away and sold our stuff, got into our Volkswagen and drove to Los Angeles and uh, got there and turned out Lindsley was on a on a tour with some other hot shots like Jim Olds and Carl Prebram uh, on the Amazon. They were, they were in a boat on the Amazon catching these animals and doing EGs on them. So he wasn't even there. So I walk in and I tell the secretary, hi, I'm the new postdoc, Leo Chalupa. She looks at me, she goes, are you sure? This is Dr. Oh, Lindsley's. <laughs> and I said, yeah, he says, she says, you have any, you have a letter from, I said, a letter? No, I don't have a letter. So she starts looking, sorry, she starts looking through the whole thing, looking, looking, and then, oh yeah, here's a note I got from Dr. Linsley. Okay, yeah, fill out these papers. <laughs> and so that's, that's how it started. And, and I, you know, I worked very hard because I had, you know, I knew my thesis wouldn't get me much. So I really, uh, and he had a huge lab, maybe eight or nine postdocs, you know, four or five graduates. So he's professor of psychology, physiology, and uh, psychiatry, you know, labs all over. So I was in a brain research institute and I just 
you know, I just worked all the time. I mean, because I knew uh, if I think if things didn't work out, I was toast, you know, and things didn't, did work out. I got a science paper published, you know, I got a, about eight or nine other papers published and I soon became kind of his favorite postdoc because I was always ready to work. You know, so if he said, um, uh, you want to work on a paper this Saturday? Yep. You know, and uh, you, uh, you, uh, you want to work Saturday night? Yep. You know, just tell me when you want to do it, you know. So I spent five nice years with him and, and was actually, uh, at that time, UC required that faculty retire at a certain age, 66, mm. you had to retire, okay? And so Don had reached that age and he was very upset about it, but you couldn't do anything, it was, it was the state law, you know? So he told, he, he told me, he spoke to the Dean about me getting a job, assistant professor at UCLA, you know, because five years, I would get one of his labs. So. And then, you know, I was excited about that, but then I talked to some of the people in psychology and they said, um, you know, where my appointment would be. And they said, it's a bad idea. And I said, why? He said, number one is people are gonna think yeah, nepotism, which of course was mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And number two is you'll never be independent. He says, you know, the old man will come to the lab and say, let's do this. And what are you going to do? You're going to throw him out? He says, better go somewhere, you know, where you could be, run your own shop and so on. And, and then uh, I, I, I never really looked for a job I, I got, I, at that time. So people were kind of asking me, you know, if I was interested in a job. So I ended up coming to Davis. Uh, a guy called me from there. I, I, I was retired recently and asked me if I was interested in a position in the psychology department. And there was actually a, a job in the physiology department as well at that time. Uh, but for various reasons, I, uh, so in 1975, we packed up our Volkswagen again and, uh, went up to Davis and, and it was a very different kind of world. You know, psychology had about, uh, 13 people, maybe one NIH grant, you know, it was, if you had a grant, it was okay. If you didn't have a grant, that was fine as well. You know, I was kind of like. Okay, go to the faculty club, have a nice, uh, you know, lunch. And Fridays, we'd all get to the faculty club for heavy duty drinking and playing pool and cards. But, uh, but I, you know, I, I knew I had to get a grant. And I, and so I worked hard. Uh, I, uh, I asked for a 30 million, 30 million, $30,000 startup <laughs> package for neurophysiology lab. They gave me 7,000. Oh, I asked for 30. And so, so, so hard. And then I negotiated up to eight, 8,000 they gave me. And uh, they gave me four courses to teach, uh, to oh, start gosh. right off the bat, none of which yeah. I ever taught before, okay? So I started writing, you know, and my, my first NIH grant and uh, wrote this, at that time there was no page limit. I wrote this 85 page, 85 page NIH grant. Goodness. And that got crashed big time. I, 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 the funny thing is uh, before I handed it in, I knew somebody in, in the animal physiology department, which is now defunct as you know, uh, and asked him if he could read it. He was a senior professor. And he kindly said, yeah, he would. And he called me up and he said, you know, this is an empire building lab, a grant. And you're just an assistant professor. You know, I, I would cut that down. I said, you know, you're asking for two technicians and stuff. And I thought, ah, small time Davis guy, what does he know? So I, so I hand it in, the thing comes back, I get thrashed and it says, this is an empire building grant. <laughs> Oh, hmm, I should have listened. And, and then, you know, and then I, I, I applied again and I didn't get it again. I got turned down again, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, pretty cool remarks from the study state. Like this guy doesn't really know what he's doing and, and all this sort of stuff. And then, and I was, you know, pretty distraught. Although I never felt that you needed a grant, uh, to get tenure at that time, you know? So that wasn't an issue. It yeah. was just that I had to have, you know, I had to, I had to be like my peers, you know, like, the people in the business that I knew. And uh, I tried a third time and I, I uh, called the NIH guy and he said, yeah, we're gonna fund you. Your score is gonna have to be funded. I was ecstatic, ecstatic. I had two grad students who basically were for nothing. You know, I, I, I sent some equipment off to be, to, to be uh, refurbished and all that sort of stuff, waiting for the letter to come, waiting for the letter to come. And one day my wife and I were gonna drive to LA to visit some friends, you know, summertime. No air conditioning in the car, hot as hell. I yeah. stop in the psychology office in Young Hall to get, see the letter come. There it is, a letter from NIH. I take it out, you know. This is exactly what it said. It is a pleasure to inform you that your grant, blah, 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 was re recommended for funding by the National Research Council, by the National 
like um, uh, I uh, counsel on this and this date. Unfortunately, due to oh. unforeseen uh, uh, funding cuts, we are unable to fund this grant or removing it from any further consideration. Oh God. I was like, I couldn't believe it, you know? Oh. So I called, the, I called the guy up and I got him, you know, in Washington. I said, Dr. Uh, I said, remember his name, Dr. Halas. I said, I said, you know, I got this letter. I don't understand. And he said, did you read the letter? I said, uh, yes, sir, I did. He said, why are you calling me? I said, but, but you told me uh, a month ago. He said, did you read the letter? I said, yeah. He said, well, why are you calling me? He says, call your congressman. They cut off funding. There's no funding. We can't fund you. There's no funding. So <sighs> I thought, that's it. I'm done, you know. But then uh, things turned out. I got a little grant, you know, uh, from the uh, from some kind of foundation and stuff like that. And then the big breakthrough for me was I applied kind of on a lark because it was a very short application for Guggenheim Fellowship, for Guggenheim, you know. Mm -hmm. And I got it. You know, it's like one in a thousand get it. I got it. And that permitted me to go to Cambridge for a year to work with Colin Blakemore and all the big time guns, guns, you know, Horace Barlow. And that was a big turning point for me. And then when I came back, I, uh, within a year, I had two NIH grants. And I don't think I ever got turned down again because I, they, put me, they put me first on NSF panel and then, and, I, and then NEI panel. And so I learned what an idiot I was that I didn't know how to write grants. You know, it wasn't that I was stupid. I just didn't know how to do it. Yeah. And, and so once, once, I, once I was on those panels, I knew exactly how to do it. And so, you know, so, I had, so after that, I never – but I came really pretty close to kind of saying, okay, that's it. I just can't do it. I can't compete with these guys. These guys, these guys are too good. I'm not good enough. So it was a pretty dark time in the beginning. But, you know, both of them have turned out to be okay. I didn't know about that, but that, that really explains a lot in terms of your persistence and your resilience and, and the advice that you would give us as assistant professors to, you know, focus on what it is that you want to do. If you want to do research, then it doesn't matter how many times you're rejected. You just keep on applying. It's great advice. That's exactly amazing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so how many years were you a psychology professor before you became chair of, of, of the new neurobiology, physiology, and behavior department? Yeah, so I was uh, in psychology for quite a long time. Uh, let me see, I came 75, I would guess until maybe early 90s, mm -hmm. you know, and what, what happened was, uh, uh, you know, once I, once I started getting funding and, 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 and like Guggenheim and some other recognitions, things like that, I stood out, you know, at that time, there were not as many top notch people like there are now. So, so it was easy to stand out. And some, uh, what was a big break for me was that I somehow got noticed by um, uh, Bob Gray, who was who I didn't know at all. He was chair of chair of um, zoology, and he became dean of um, biology. There was no college of biological sciences, no division of biological sciences, and and um, he asked me to serve on a council for biological sciences that he chaired. And it was a, a it was a, a, a campus wide council of about thirty people med school people vet school people psychology people and out of that uh, council I, Bob was very very skillful in leading all these people with very diverse points of view what should be you know and so on and and out of that came the idea of having a division of biological sciences in which there would be sections not not a college sections. And when and then and then there's a question: What should we call it? So so uh, so I I voted for uh, a section of neurobiology. Mm -hmm. But then but then there was somebody. Uh, uh, oh, Peter Marler. Peter Marler said it should be a section of neuro neuropsychology, the neurobiology and behavior. Mm -hmm. But then Barbara Horowitz said, "Well, <laughs> I'm a physiologist. It should be so." The, so the three of us were in a council. So we said, "Okay, let's call it." Uh, the, the section of neurobiology, physiology, behavior. So that's how, that's how it came to be. Okay, it was, you know, everybody wanted to be included. And so once that got formed, uh, 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 Gray took me aside and he said, look, uh, I think you'd be, it'd be good for the section, good for you if you got transferred to the section. 
I said, really? He said, yeah, I think, I think that would be a good thing. And in the meantime, I was asked by a, the dean of the medical school if I wanted to transfer into the medical school, mm -hmm. into human physiology. And so like all of a sudden, you know, like, wow, you know, and again, it's one of these things that, that, that when there aren't that many, you know, top people, you stand out if you're doing okay. You know what I mean? I mean, today, today, it wouldn't be enough because there's so many gunslingers now. Yeah, and you you don't have a lot of them in your in your center, and 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 so there are so many you know top people at that time. There's very few uh, neuroscience people, which we can talk about later. So I said, sure, I'll I'll do it. How do I do it? And he said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. You know, so psychology had to vote and so on, all that kind of stuff. So at first, uh, I kept part of my appointment in psychology because I needed the animal space, and they had a very nice histology room that I got built up of and so on. So I think I was 80%. So I decided no med school at that time because they didn't have the space and I thought I'd be, I'd be better off in, you know, in, 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 in biology. And so that's what happened. And let me see. Oh, yeah, okay. So what happened then is Barbara Horowitz was chairperson, okay, mm -hmm. of the section. But she was part of the old animal physiology department. And somewhere before that, I had... Uh, recruited Mike to be director of the Center of, of Neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And so I was you know, a faculty member. And then when Mike left, Bob asked me to be the second director. Yep. And I did that. And, and, and then I, I, well, we can get talking to that by it, but I felt that coming in after Mike, they really didn't give me any resources at all. It was like, you know, whatever Mike left, I think there's one position left, whatever, you know. And so I, I decided that the way to move forward was to talk the administration into going to phase two and bring in somebody from the outside that could get a lot of resources because, and so I, I, I talked to Bob about it, you know, and I said, look, we've got a good core of people, but we don't have enough for critical mass. And so I said, if you, if you allocate another $10 million and 10 more positions, I guarantee I'll recruit somebody great you know, somebody great, uh, come on. And he said, well, what about you? I said, I said, you know, I said, Barbara's going to step down as NPB chair. I said, I'd like to do that. He said, great. Let's do that. So, so that's exactly what happened. So, so I went, I went, I became chair of NPB and, and I started, you know, I chaired a recruitment committee uh, for what ended up, you know, Ted. So I went from the, from where you are, that is building to NPB. And, and we started getting, you know, people came in more and more people came in into 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 the unit so so when i took over mpb there were four or five grants nih grants in the whole section at that time and i think there were 16 people there were there were two people who never showed up to work one was an md who seriously who worked for kaiser full-time and I only found out about that because one weekend when I was in when I was in my office, the fax machine came, and it was from somebody at Kaiser about a patient. And I was like, "This must be a mistake." And it turned out it was one of my faculty members. <laughs> oh, and apparently, you know, there was some kind of agreement that she had whatever. Well, you know, I was not going to put up with that, you know. And there was somebody else who had a second job somewhere else. I mean, it was just in a whole different world. Well, you know, and so in very quick order, it went from uh, uh, kind of like if you get a grant, nice to like you better get a grant if you want to be in the section. And yeah. and she got more and more people who were you know top notch people uh, who came in. Uh, the people who didn't get grants left. You know, mm -hmm. they retired. They just didn't feel comfortable, right? When people are talking about, hey, I just got my R one renewed. I'm going to get invited to this meeting in Paris. And, so these people kind of went like, hmm, maybe this is not the place for me anymore. So the culture changed in, mm -hmm. in a big way, you know, and, and, and it was great to see that. It was just great. And, and, and the, you know, we had a thing where we had very few faculty meetings only when we needed something. You know, it was completely mm -hmm. democratic. Uh, one of the things I did, which the dean, uh, uh, who was my nominal boss, Mark McAmey, thought it was crazy. One of the challenges there was it was neurobiology, which was – Neuroscience, the dominant component, right? I was, you know, people from the center came, and, the, and so so that was the big, big uh, contingent of people. Then there were a few in behavior, 
like three mm -hmm. in behavior, and there were like three or four in physiology. So neurobiology by far, you know, they could outvote anybody. So I, so I, I, I passed this rule that if there are three faculty that object to anything, you know, any kind of, we're not going to do it. Yeah. You know, there are three. And Mark McAmey said, you'll never get anything done. N never. Because you're always going to have three naysayers. I said, yeah, but it's going to make people secure. And I don't think that. And it happened that not once, not once did anything get, you know, overruled. We had a couple, we had a couple of close calls where two people were good. And so, so, you know, it made people feel nobody's going to gang up on you. You know, neurobiology is not going to gang up on you. And so it grew into a pretty fantastic department. But in general, you know, they I just all over. I mean, psychology is now one of the top departments in, in the country. You know, I yep. mean, it, it's just it's just amazing to see that. Uh, and 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 uh, I think I think uh, nobody would have believed it way back then. You know. Well, and and NPB is one of the largest majors at UC Davis now too. So NPB and psychology, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. So when you look back on your time as chair, what are some of your fondest memories? Well, it's seeing people succeed, mm -hmm. you know, as simple as that, seeing people succeed. Uh, I mean, I mean, to me, uh, reading a letter, to, you know, going a letter to somebody got tenure, you know, mm -hmm. that was like, like, uh, made me feel great, you know, made me feel great and, and, and trying to lessen the anxiety of new faculty as much as I could, you know, telling them you you got to shoot for being one of the best of the best, but don't make yourself crazy over it, you know, and 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 and, and you're gonna come in and and we of course I mean of course hired the very best people. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean I mean a lot of that was due to the, to the center to, and so with both Mike and then Ted, and so we got these great people. And, uh, you know, great pedigrees, unlike me, <laughs> who had great, great PhDs, with, with very well connected, great postdocs. And even some, even some of those people struggled, you know, with the first grant and mm -hmm. so on. So I would say, don't worry about it. I mean, I remember, I am not to tell you who it is, but somebody who is a real hot shot that everybody was so happy to get. And this guy came from Harvard. Uh, to give you a hint, he's no longer, he, he's no longer in the center. He, he left to, to go abroad. And he came in with this grant application on, on a particular uh, molecule he was working on. And I looked at it, you know, in five minutes, I said, this is way over ambitious, which is what I was told. I said, you know, you're just assistant professor. You got five specific aims. I said, get, get it down to four, three would be better. Oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is good. This is great. Uh, this, is, this is exactly what, what they want. <laughs> I said, all right. You know, I said, I said, but I'm going to tell you. I said, if I was you, get it down to... Get one, wait, get rid of one. I said, I have, I've been on study section for years. I have never seen anybody not getting funded because they had too little work. But I've seen lots of people getting not funded because they had too much, okay? Yeah. You've got too much. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand this field. So he said, you know, I mean, so I said, okay. So, so six months later, he walks in my office like somebody shot him in the head. I got triaged. <laughs> I said, okay, let me see, let me see the comments. Look at the comments. I said, see that? All you gotta do is take out that specific game, just delete it. Don't argue with it. Thank them for the comments and then fix these other two little things. You know, so he went from being three triage to getting eight percentile. Yeah. I said, you should listen to me because I've been around for a while and I've seen it happen. <laughs> like, okay, sorry. You know, so, 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 so getting, getting people some of that wisdom, uh, quote unquote wisdom and, and, and making them successful is fantastic. And then, and then and, you know, and seeing people become international, uh, international players in, in no time at all, right? And 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 that changed the entire campus from 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 people saying to me initially, "Why did you ever go to Davis?" Right? To people saying, "Can you give me a job in Davis? Is there any way you can yeah. give me a job?" In you know, uh, so there's this tremendous turnaround, and 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 um, and I mean, I, I I love to see the success of people and how they uh, form their own uh, networks, you know, and getting invitations to Gordon conferences and all this kind of stuff. It's just fantastic. You know, getting invitations to give talks to the best places and being hot shots and in the, in the, in the study for neuroscience, you know, that, that was all great for, for them, for, for the department and for everybody. So I felt, I felt, uh, and it gave me, you know, it gave me a lot of energy. 
So I would, I would go, okay, let me write another grant. These guys are working hard. Let me do another grant, you know, like that. Yep. Yep. Well, and the remarkable thing to me is that you did all of this and you, you affected all of our lives because you gave me great advice on my first R01 as well. Um, but you did all of this while maintaining a, a really active, preeminent uh, research program. And, and I think that that really inspired everyone around you that, that you, can do, you can do all of these things at once. Yeah, I was, you know, I was very, very fortunate uh, in the terms of the people uh, that I had, uh, you know, I mean, by and large, I had a few problems uh, over the years, like everybody, but by and large, I had people who really knew me, you know, I knew my, my foibles and stuff, uh, including the office manager for MPB, you know, who was terrific and 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 knew when to come in to talk to me about problems and not and people in the lab as well you know people uh not, not only uh, were devoted to doing good science but people that were uh, fun to be with you know i i, I don't want any dramas about this that and the other and, and and those kind of people go work with somebody else because you know life is too short right so the fun fact the fun factor was always a big thing for me you know the fun factor because because it's a tough business and and some people are are are, are um, just um, not into that. You know, some people kind of kind of they've got to, they've got to be. I mean, being competitive is great, but but don't take out don't take it out on somebody else. You know, especially in the department or in the lab or anything like this. You know, yeah, so sure. co being collegial within the lab within the department. I remember, you know, one time a senior faculty member when I first took over as chair was screaming at the accountant okay he was really upset about some mistakes she made. and she didn't make a mistake you know and i and as you know my office was right there so i so i came out and i said oh what's going on and and the poor woman was in tears you know and and, and he was really was really upset so i so i said um i said hey uh you know i knew i don't want to talk to him right then yeah. i said hey uh can you pop in like at 3 30 we can have some tea together and, and stuff about something I want to discuss with you. And he goes, Oh, I can't make it three thirty. I said, How about four? Can't make it four. I said, How about four thirty? Uh four forty five. I said, Okay. <laughs> so uh so you know, so I calmed down, you know, the accounting person. I said, Don't worry, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then he came down and and I actually wanted to get his advice on something that was, you know, important and stuff. And then we finished I said, Hey, li listen, I said, I never want to hear you berating a a staff member ever again if you want to be in this department and he sort of looked at me and he, and he, and he said I well, said never ever do that ever and, and and he kind of stunned and he said you know it would be really nice if tomorrow you could apologize you know think it over I mean okay a mistake was made I mean haven't you made mistakes I said I make mistakes all the time you know but like you know it did cost me I said look how much money did it cost you? He said it cost me fourteen hundred dollars. Whatever that, whatever you know. She, I said, you know, you know what? I'll take care of that fourteen hundred dollars from my discretionary funds. Not a problem. Really? So the next day he came here and he bought the staff member flowers. You know, little, uh -huh. and it was, and it changed the entire culture in the office. You know, uh -huh. they knew they had their back, and 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 that I had their back, and and so on, and and. Uh, I, I can't remember, I can't think of, I mean, I guess, I don't know how many years I was chair, 12 or whatever it was. I can't think of anybody else that was, you know, that there was ever a problem with again like that. And, uh, you know, people get upset at times and stuff, but, but so, so it was pretty much kind of a happy family, you know, which is, which is uncommon, in, common, uncommon in academia, as you know. And by the way, uh, I will say this, that of all the, from, from when I first got there in 75 until I left, uh there was only one person in the large neuroscience community that i did not trust to be a good colleague everybody else was great and one of the reasons i think you know why why uh, why uh davis could come up so high in not just in neuroscience but in everything but so, well let's just say neuroscience is and this is remarkable this is really remarkable because the people who were working on the thing, like uh, Brian Maloney, like Martin Wilson, even put in John Horowitz into that, and and and, and uh, you know many others, the the, the, the old timers, they were uh, they were not afraid to get people better than them, which is very unusual, you know. 
a lot of times the people are threatened. I, I, I don't want this guy because, you know, because this guy's, and, 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 and they work for the common good. You know, they work for the common good. So, so there wasn't anything like, you know, if people started saying, oh, you can't have Gazanica because he's cognitive and I'm in molecular, so I can't, I don't want him. You know, they realized that this guy could build something and that would help everybody. And, 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 and they voted unanimously for him. You know, so it wasn't like, if it's not good for me, I don't want it. So, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is what was remarkable that with the exception of one individual, uh, everybody worked for the common good. You know, they work for the common good, which which was amazing to me, you know, to do that. And and that's unusual. You know, that's unusual. People people will 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 uh, 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 say, what's in it for me? If it's, there's nothing in it for me, I don't want it kind of thing. And that's what permitted us, you know, to go forward further and further, further on and so on. Yeah, I think another sort of speaking to that, I think another aspect that that really helped the whole entire community were um training grants and and um core grants and and you really did that within vision sciences you you really grew vision sciences because of bringing in a core grant that 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 helped every lab and bringing in a training grant and, and you set the culture so that so that more of us did that in other fields after you that well, was really important let me, uh, uh, somehow you slid down and all i see is the top of your head I don't know why that is. I hope that's not the case for the actual thing. I don't think so. Can I see. I see the whole thing. You see yourself okay? All right. Yeah. Yep. Let me tell you a quick story about the core grant. You know, which is which is a lesson in it. So at some point, you know, I, oh, there you're perfect. I see. Perfect. At some point, I found out about the core grant, vision core, because as you as you know, NEI does not get program projects, but they get for core grants, and so I. Uh, Thought okay, you know, oh, you ha you had to have a minimum number of R ones in in the NEI, and we did. I think either you or Barbara Chapman or somebody got the, the eight grant, so we had the minimum number, which was eight. And so I talked to John Keltner, who was then uh, chair of ophthalmology. I said, you know, why don't we apply for a core grant? And John said, uh, don't waste your time. I said, what do you mean? And he said, look, uh, UCSF has got one, Berkeley's got one, UCLA's got one. San Diego's got one. That's four in California. They, there are only 30 in the country. And, you know, they limit the numbers to 30. They're not going to give us one, especially since you got, no, it's Stanford, UCF, and Berkeley. They each had one. So there are three just, you know, when driving this. So we're not going to get one. And I said, well, let me try, you know. And so I started working on this thing and, you know, I put together the core and all that. I, I actually, you know, enjoyed working on it. So I put this whole thing together and I forget how many cores there were. So there's one core in the center. Oh, uh, I think one core in the medical school, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in campus, one score, one core in the, in, in biology. And I think there may have been one in Sacramento. So there were like four cores spread. And so, you know, I'm thinking about it and I'm, I, I look up, who is the NEI guy that deals with cores? And I find this guy's name. So I call him up. I had no idea, I, you know, I had no idea who he was. I call him up. And I said, you know, uh, I'm so and so, and he knew my name. He goes, oh yeah, yeah, you're on this B. I said, yeah, I'm on study second. I said, I said, you know, I'm putting on on a core grant. Are you in charge of core grants? He says, yes, I am. I said, I wonder if I could ask you a favor. Can I FedEx you this core grant and take a look? You know what you think? And he goes, well, uh, that's highly. I said, I can get it out to you tomorrow. You'll have it tomorrow, okay? And I, well, I said, okay, I'll, I'll just mail it out to you. Can you give me the address? <laughs> so I, so I FedEx it to him, right? I FedEx it to him. I. I call him up two days later. He goes, oh, yeah, I got to have a chance to look at it. I said, how about if I come out uh, and talk to you next Tuesday? Do you have any time at all? And he goes, uh, what do you mean come out? I said, I'll just fly out to, you know, to, 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 to Bethesda, to Rockville, actually, and maybe we can just talk about the core grant. He said, you're going to come out just for that? I said, yeah. He said, uh, well, okay, uh, 4 o'clock. I said, sure, I'll be there. Oh, God. So I so I fly out from Sacramento to there. You know, I, 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 uh, I, the flight came in in the afternoon. I had dinner uh, by myself, actually. The next day, kind of did sightseeing. I went to see this guy, okay? So I go to see him, and, you know, and he's uh, been there forever, right? And he's read this thing, and he's telling me stuff that's useless. You know, just useless information. And I'm kind of, you know, he's telling me, well, this is all reviewed by other core grants, and the only way you can get one is somebody gets knocked out, and I'm, Sitting there, I'm thinking, I just wasted money and I wasted time. 
you know, this was just completely wasted time. So I say to him, I said, well, let me ask you a final question. I said, is there anything in here that you see that's a problem? Is there anything at all? And he goes, oh, sure. I said, well, what? And he said, well, you know, they don't like the fact that cores are separated. He said, they all want the cores to be in a single building. There was one the last time where one of the cores was across the street and they got triaged. And you got cores all over the place. You got cores 15 miles apart. They're gonna hate that. I go, really? He goes, oh yeah. He said, uh, a dedicated building would be good. Okay. Oh, I go, uh, okay. Thank you very much. You know, we're screwed. So I fly back, you know, and thing has to be submitted like in about a week. Well, you can't put them all in building. We haven't got a building. You know, yeah. we haven't got any space. So I'm sitting there thinking, 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 you know. And then I then I decide to make up a thing. This is absolutely true. I write a thing saying concluding remarks, a section at the end of the grant. I said the reviewers will no doubt have noticed that our four course course are separated by uh, in different areas of the UC Davis campus. And I repeat where they are. I said, in most cases, this would be considered to be a major uh, a disadvantage to achieving the aims of the course. However, in the case of UC Davis, there are five reasons why this is actually an advantage. And then I make up these five reasons. You know, number one, we had number two, so on, okay. The thing was back. From you know, from from review, and it said uh, the PI did a remarkably strong case for why these scores should be located in the areas that they are on the UC Davis campus, which is the largest campus in the UC system. Uh, it's San awesome. Diego loses this, San Diego loses this, and we get it. Okay, and after that, it's still running. You know, it is still running. And, yeah, and so that that trip, which probably cost me a thousand bucks all total, you know, and that talking to that guy. And that hail and Mary, you know, kind of pass at the end, was what it, what did it, you know? Otherwise, otherwise I would have been trashed, and we would probably never had a core core like that, you know. So it just goes to show you that getting information and dealing, as you well know, you know, dealing with a problem head on. I mean, what could I say? You know, ignore it, you know, or yeah. you couldn't lie about it, you know. So yeah. I just said, and I came up with these reasons, you know, do we we have a very integrated group, even though we're geographically separated by having these things separate. I think I think I should find what I wrote. I mean, it was brilliant. It took me like 20 versions to write that one long paragraph and they loved it. You know, but you ended up getting so, it. And, and, and out of that so they, came the, the center for vision sciences and all of, you know, all of the, the real strength and vision exactly, that has just exactly. only bloomed since then. Yeah. Exactly. Somebody, uh, the head of extramural research for NEI would, would have gotten, I'll get her name now, quite well later on. She said, she said, you guys at UC Davis had had, uh, the core grant had more positive impact on visual sciences at UC Davis than any campus in the country that she knew about, you know? Yeah. And so, so yeah, so that was one of those, one of those, you know, wins that worked out. I mean, it could have just worked the other way. Yeah. So Leo, let's um let's let's turn to talking about um when you moved into uh the uh the dean's office and um moving up into into higher leadership positions. So so what drew you to do that? Well, I was on I was on the search committee to um to recruit for um Phyllis Weiss. Uh, no, to recruit for the dean. Was Mark McAmey uh, was going to leave to become provost at at um, uh, Virginia Tech, and so Bob and I was I don't think I was the chair. Maybe I was the chair of that committee. Uh, and so we had uh, a number of good people, and Phyllis Weiss, uh, who was chair of physiology in, in Kentucky, it was a Kentucky Medical School, was by far by far the best candidate. And so everybody agreed, you know, okay, she's going to be the one. Uh, but then she couldn't come for almost a year okay mm -hmm. and so bob called me and he said look uh great job recruiting her but you know we need you to step in because bob is mark is leaving and so on and uh and i said well you know it's not a good time for me and all he says i'm not asking you i'm telling you <laughs> oh, he said you need to you need to, i said all right and 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 i gotta and i gotta tell you uh, another quick little anecdote so Mark McAmey was a very nice guy, too nice to be Dean. 
you know, he could he could he could not um, really uh, get the people to toe the line. And he had a very powerful, maybe he's still there, uh, a head of a of a of a um, center, very good scientist, very good scientist, who fought continuously with the chair of us, uh, the, the section of cell molecular biology. They, they fought over everything. And Mark was actually had to be taken to the hospital one time because he had an anxiety attack after dealing with these guys, okay? Oh, God. And, and one of the reasons why he left was because, I mean, they were, you know, I would come into, because I had my, my whatever, it was weekly meeting with him or whatever, it was twice a month. And whenever these guy, one of these guys left, he would be red as a beet, you know. So get this, he, uh, I decided to be dean, you know, I accepted to be dean, and uh, he calls me and he says, uh, "This was on a Wednesday." He said, "I'm leaving town this weekend, uh, but I need." I set up a three-hour meeting with these two individuals, you know, the, the, the head of the Center for Molecular Biology and the chair of the section. And you need to know, it's a three hour meeting. You need to know all the issues that they've been fighting about because that's going to now be in your lap. And I said, well, what? And he says, yeah, that's going to be your number one problem. I said, uh, okay. I, and then I thought about it. I call him back. I said, you know what? When is the meeting? He said, uh, Friday morning at nine o'clock. It'll go from nine to noon. I said, you know what? Make the meeting 10 minutes from nine to nine, 10. And he said, no, you don't understand. I said, Mark. You're leaving on this weekend. Make it from nine to nine ten, okay? So all right. So I come to his office like eight fifty five, and at promptly nine o'clock, the chair of the section comes down. You know, I knew these guys and not well, and he's kind of a very mild mannered guy who basically is passive aggressive. You know, he holds his breath if he doesn't get anything. Five minutes late, in comes the other guy who's like a cowboy guy. You know, comes in big boots. You know, big coffee. Puts the coffee on the desk. Some of the coffee spills over, you know. And he goes, what is this confusion? My secretary told me it's a three-hour meeting, and now I'm told 10 minutes. What's going on? And Mark says, well, we all wanted the three hours. Leah wants it to be 10 minutes. So they look at me. I said, yeah, okay. I said, you know, I'm, I'm taking over as dean on Monday. Mark's leaving this weekend. I said, I understand there's all kinds of issues that you guys have. I said, here's the deal. Uh, why don't you guys go to Biba's for lunch or dinner? Order the, the best wine, whatever you want, martinis, I'll, I'll pay for it and work out your differences. And then send me a page of what the differences were and what you worked out and get it to me, what, let's say 30 days from now. And they look at me and they go, what? I said, yeah, just go ahead and do it. I said, you know, I don't, I don't know what the issues are, just work it out. And they kind of, I said, oh, and by the way, if you don't work it out, you're out as director of the center and you're out as the head of the section. <laughs> and the guy looks at me and he says, are you threatening me? I said, I wouldn't threaten anybody. I'm just telling you, you know, what's going to happen. I said, you know, work your thing out. Have a great. I said, in fact, even have two dinners. You know, don't worry about the money. I said, thanks, guys. You know, and by the way, I respect both of you. I'm, I'm from what I know, you're, you're great members of the faculty and, and you're big assets to the college and, 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 and the university. So I know you're going to work it out. And guess what? They came back about two weeks later. Uh, eight of the ten points they worked out. I had to come in and make some, you know, negotiations, whatever it is. And then I had a big opening uh, as dean. Uh, the opening for the, uh, you know, the school year. People came up and said, "How'd you get those two guys talking? How'd you get?" I said, "I bought them a nice dinner." <laughs> and never had never had problems with them at all. But as a result of that year, uh, and so the other the other thing is. Uh, I, 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 uh, Mark would have meetings from uh, nine o'clock till five o'clock. All my meetings were only in the morning because I had a lab to run. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't have a lab anymore. And so I told, I told uh, Sharon, who is the dean's person, I said, um, just make the meetings uh, no longer than thirty minutes because mm -hmm. they would go. You know, people would come in and mainly they wanted money. You know, they would come in there and they, and, and I would say, how much and for what? Mm -hmm. right? I remember that. <laughs> How much and for what? And I said, okay, write me, write me a, a email, you know, justifying, but just make it one screen, you know, why you need that money for that, and then I'll get back to you in a few days, like that. Mm -hmm. So I was actually able to do that, and and and, and not have, you know, so at, at one o'clock I went back to lab stuff, and and you know wrote papers, and I, I think I actually even submitted a, 
a grant that got funded. But as a result of that, I started getting calls, not calls, well, I guess calls, yeah, from headhunters mm -hmm. about jobs at other places. And one of them was UCLA as life oh. sciences being where I was a postdoc, where I was a postdoc. And by the way, you and Marty's name come up in this. And, you know, I thought, gosh, you know, and I called Pashko about this. And Pashko said, Leo, Pashko Rakish, UCLA, it is a serious school. You should consider it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, oh, well, so, I, so I actually made about five visits down there, five or six visits down there. One of them was a visit, you know, I mean, you, you, you guys are being recruited with the, with the dean. I think his name is mm -hmm. Tupin or Pepper, or I forget his name, something mm -hmm. like that, who had raised over a billion dollars for the medical school, including wow. a big gift from David Geffen, right? And so in talking to the dean and two of the associate deans in his office, you know, in LA, uh, I, I said, I said, you know, UCLA is fantastic, okay? But actually, you guys should be doing better because you're now losing faculty to UC Davis. And he said, uh -oh. what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I said, well, there are two great faculty we recruited. Uh, what are their names? So I tell him, you know, you and Marty. He picks up the phone and he gets the, the, uh, a hold of the director of the Center for Neuroscience uh, 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 or whatever it was, neurobiology. And he says, is it true that you we offer jobs to these two people and they turn us down? And, and then he puts on the phone and he goes, how'd you guys do that? I said, we're great at Davis. I said, and you guys need to be better. So, oh, gosh. In, in terms of recruiting people, so you got your name actually came up, and so and so, uh, you know, I made about five or six. I didn't like the chancellor at all. I met with the chancellor twice. He was a very arrogant physicist who spent about an hour talking about what biology should be like, you know. Mm -hmm. But they offered me the job, and and they actually were going to get a condo for me. But Tanya and I talked it over and stuff, and I said, look, we're happy here in Davis, you know. Uh, I, I mean. What do I want to do that and, you know, give everything up and all this kind of stuff. And I was going to get really nice space at unlimited money, practically, in Jules Stein. You know, when I met him, Chairman of the moment, he basically said, uh, well, what do you think it'll take, you know, for a lab? And I said, gee, I, 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 I don't know, maybe like, and he said, would $3 million be enough? I said, yeah, that'd be enough. <laughs> you know, it was clear. And money was not a problem, you know, or in that thing. I said, yeah. He said, all right, and just, you know, just look at some of the space and, and you know, let me know what kind of space you, you'd need. All right, but ultimately didn't do it. And then I started getting, you know, uh, more phone calls, like maybe mm -hmm. three or four a year. And and then uh, what happened was our daughter had moved to Washington and gave birth to 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 Sophie, our old, our first granddaughter. So we actually had a little condo in Washington. And one day I got a phone call, you know, asked me if I was interested in being to be vice president at, of research at George Washington. I thought he said. Washington University. And I said, no, I'm not interested in going to St. Louis. I said, I'm just, you know, I've been to St. Louis. People love it, but that's not me. I'm an East Coast, West Coast guy. He said, no, he says, this is in Washington. I said, oh. I said, well, I don't know. I talked to my wife and he said, oh, they're going. Yeah. I said, they're probably calling 100 people. To make a long story short, you know, again, I went out for a bunch of, you know, a bunch of uh, visits and stuff. And it was really like uh, Davis deja vu. So, Leo, you were just telling us about GW and and um, moving to GW. Well, what I, what I was going to say is uh, that I was hoping that this is going to be another UC Davis kind of, you know, thing going from a low level to high level. And for a while, it looked like it was going to be, you know, uh, in, in terms of what I was able to do. But the fact of the matter is the, the, that the culture here is so different and so that to make it short, it never really worked out. So, so they got the, the, they 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 pushed out the president who recruited me after ten years. So I was vice president for about nine and a half years. They brought in somebody who was not very good at all, who didn't last for more than four years, and and so on. So what's happened is the research never really worked out. I hired somebody to be the director of stuff for Nero and La Mancha. You know, he left as soon as I stepped down. I hired a guy from Yale to be the head of autism. He left as soon as I stepped down. And what it taught me was something you take for granted, which is the importance of the culture of a place and the importance of the top leadership, you know, to make the place great. So Davis, everybody knows, by the way, that Davis is a powerhouse now, you know, across everybody. 
I mean, you know, you know, I was in 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 uh, in uh, Japan not that long ago. That people know about Davis. You know, you know, they know they know it's a great school. Before they only knew it was the ag school and maybe genetics. You know, and now and now, like in every every way, autism is known for neuroscience is known for you know gene uh, molecular stuff is known for the the, the gene center is known for it's it's unbelievable and you see it on so. But that takes a certain culture of the faculty, right? And the people and above that, that foster that and permit that and so on. And the fact is that uh, GW uh, was, is a big disappointment and, my, and they're going backwards. And my guess is they will never be at that level. And it's, and it's really a crying shame because there's no reason, you know, recruiting in Washington is very easy. People want to yeah. come here, you can recruit people here. But it's the zygous. You don't have that. Hey, let's get somebody better than us. It's like, do we really need this guy? I mean, you know, uh, he's he's too much into grants. Right? You know what I mean? So it shows uh, what a remarkable place UC Davis is, and and I will forever uh, be grateful to have been part of that story. You know, uh, thinking about when I first got there, and uh, and what a sleepy little place it really was in many respects. Certainly in, in, in neuroscience and now uh due to people like you and many others it's a powerhouse i mean it's one of the, and, and 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 psychology too you know it's going to be so great uh, so so it just gives me uh, a tremendous amount of personal satisfaction and it's interesting uh i don't really care who sees this you know this this video or maybe my grandkids will at some point whatever but it just knowing it myself you know, what a top-notch place it is. And my guess is it'll continue, you know, for a long, long time to come. Because because uh, good people get good people and get good people and good people. And so so we've been, uh, I've been very fortunate to be part of that. And, and I'm very grateful, you know. It, 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 it kind of goes beyond anything done in, in science and stuff, citations. You know, I did okay. Um, I was happy to be a player, you know, with, the, with top guns and so on. And get invited to the big meetings and give you know give lectures and all that stuff but knowing that uc davis is no oh, it is a serious school as yeah. as Bakshka would say so so thank you for taking the time for the interview and thank you for being part of this thing you might recall way back when uh i told you at some point you're going to be director for the center for neuroscience kim and, and i i don't you think could. you believe me at, at that point but 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 you've done Probably, you know, to be honest with you, uh, although times change, you've probably done a better job than Mike or 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 Ed yes. or me or yeah, you know, and 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 so the first woman director has kind of uh, uh, outdid the big boys, you know. Oh, in, Leo. In so you yeah, should be you should smart. be very 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 proud of that. I mean, very proud of that. You know, the idea to to be able to raise uh, that kind of money. Uh, you know, I tried to do some money raising stuff when I was. But I think I got a total of $5,000 in the three years that I was directed at the center, you know, which wasn't exactly a landslide. Uh, so you should be, you should, uh, I mean, this is an achievement uh, beyond your stellar research record and the people you train and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this is just something that will be with you forever. So congratulations. Well, Leo, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And I think that I can speak for all of us at Davis. We are so grateful for all of the time and working for the common good and the vision that you had that really allowed neuroscience and, and the university to be as strong as it is. So thank you so much.